work, shall we? Um, the place you want to be, again, this is sophomore English, and today's date is the 10th of September. The place that you want to be to start with is actually with your writing assessment of the last writing assessment that you worked with. That is to say, your treatment of utopian societies as critiqued by Harrison Bergeron. What I want to do real quickly is I want to make sure that we understand fundamental compositional expectations uh, as we get ready to write then our next writing assessment, which for us is coming on page 43 and due on Thursday. Is that right? Due on Thursday. So let's have a let's have a. The next writing assessment package. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I had my master schedule turned back one week. I apologize. Due on Wednesday. That's correct. Thank you for the correction. And by the way, that's page 99. Correct? That's page 99. Uh, but instead of talking specifically about that assignment, I want to backtrack to the Harrison Bergeron paper real quickly. I'm going to work on the whiteboard. I, uh, for those of you who still need to hand this paper in, you should have it in front of you right now. You should have your red ink pen out. Um, and, uh, and there are some things I want you to be doing to and with that paper that will then allow us to set it up. Some of you will say, dude, I didn't do this and you already scored my paper. Do it now with me. Because it will help you to have some memory if you're, if you're able to do that. Now, we say all thesis writing is relational, and by that we mean what, Miss Reed? All thesis writing is relational writing. Have we, have we given this lecture already? You're giving me a look like you've not heard that term. You're right, Winters, so help out Reed and say what we mean, though, when we say all thesis writing is relational writing slash A to B. What does that even mean? And you have to relate, like, um, what you're talking about in the essay Good. the title and the Good. So, for example, what we will say in academic language, what we will say is that an academic paper for us always involves a thesis where at least two ideas are related to each other in some way. Okay? So, in other words, we're never going to write a paper where we quote unquote tell the story. First, this happens in Harrison Bergeron, then this happens in Harrison Bergeron, then this happens. No, 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 no. We passed seventh grade a long time ago. Remember, we had to do book reports. It was a great book, and I think everyone else should read it to the end. No, no. We're done with that project. Instead, our thesis writing is always relational to the degree that we have at least two ideas we're relating in some way. That's that word contiguity. Remember that bringing together of ideas. The way we represent that is in the notion of A to B. Normally, we'll think about one of these two variables as being the text itself. All right. So in this case, Harrison Bergeron, Vonnegut's classic. Okay. But we're not, we're not writing about, for example, symbolism in Harrison Bergeron, which we could. We're not writing about the use of metaphor, which we could. We're not writing about irony in Harrison Bergeron, which obviously we could, right? All of those would be legitimate topics that we would qualify as B. The assigned topic for this paper, and let's say this out loud, the first thing about being a, a really good compositional uh, um, student, a, a writer of, of good composition, is to understand what the assigned topic is. Okay, That's why you make outlines, so you can be sure what the assigned topic is. We were asked to do what in, in our B? What was our, what was our uh, topic, Ms. Kennedy, that we were asked? Like we were doing? flaws in a utopian society. Good. So we're going to call this a critique of utopian societies. <laughs> and it ends up being U.S. Sorry about that. <laughs> right? So we've got a critique of utopian societies vis-a-vis -a, -vis a text, Harrison Bergeron. Okay? Now, notice. We could extend a thesis like this to include multiple texts, right? So, for example, I could ask you, write a critique of utopian societies using Harrison Bergeron and Aiken's text Searching for Summer. We could easily do that, right? Okay. And those two texts obviously fit together rather nicely, which is why they end up in your textbook in the same unit. Okay. But we only had to use the one text. Now, the issue is, first of all, our thesis sentence. And then after that, our POVs 1, 2, and 3, our topic sentences. And this is compositionally where I need you to understand our skeleton guide, okay? As you look at your thesis, and please do so now, if you didn't do this already, do it now. With a letter A in red, you will write above the line where the mention of the text Harrison Bergeron resides in your thesis sentence, the last sentence of the first paragraph, right? There has to be some mention of the text Harrison Bergeron, Vonnegut's text. 
And in that same sentence, thesis sentence, there must be some reference to the critique of utopian societies that will be occurring in the paper. Now you want to stay away from the sophomoric formulation of, in this essay I will write about three ways the text Harrison Bergeron on critiques utopian societies. We know that you're the one writing and we know that it's an essay. So there's no point to say in this essay I will. Just simply say there are three important criticisms of utopian societies derived from a study of Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron. Right? By the way, remember, when we qualify Harrison Bergeron, we want to make sure we italicize. Correct? So that way we can show the title. Okay? Right? Don't, don't forget that. Then, in our points of validation topic sentences, we are going to have to have some element of our A and some element of our B, and we want to identify that with the letter A and the letter B above the line in our first sentence of our first POV, our first sentence of our second POV, our first sentence of our third POV. Now, observation. Um, you want to stay away from being too repetitive in your topic sentences. So you want to stay away from you know, using the same kind of formulation, topic sentence after topic sentence, so that it looks too cookie cutter like. Does that make sense, cookie cutter? Do you understand what I mean? In other words, it's like it's pressed. Okay. Granted, we are writing scaled writing. There's no na 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 I think I referenced that one already. This is scale writing, no doubt. But you're trying to be quasi-creative in the presentation of your topic sentences and points of validation. But you want to make sure you have both elements in that first sentence. Go ahead and right now do that for your paper. Do you have some mention to the text Harrison Bergeron? And do you have some new criticism of a utopian society that you're making in that topic sentence? Question? Okay. For A, do you have to have the author too, or is it just Don't the need title? the author. Don't need the author. Sometimes you'll reference the text by the author. Vonnegut suggests blah, 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 blah. Right? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Other times what you'll do is you'll reference a specific example from the text. Right? The fact that... Uh, the fact that uh, um, conformity is enforced suggests that... Utopias often look very similar because of a lack of uh, originality. See, that's a topic sentence that tells us that what you're doing, notice the fact that you know, conformity is disallowed, that's your reference to the text, saying something about a criticism of utopian societies. Nonconformities oftentimes look down upon, et cetera, et cetera. See? So you want to make sure in your topic sentences that you have both. Then, and finally, Anytime you reference the text, and we're always going to do this in our points of validation, we're always quoting from the text, that quote can be of two kinds, direct, indirect. That is to say, direct quotes, how will we know it's a direct quote? Quotation mean? marks around it. What is an indirect quote then? You speak of something. You're right, you're summarizing. So for example, you don't actually have to have it word for word, but you're kind of summarizing an event from the text, that's also quoting. You have to make sure you're doing that in each one of your points of validation or I've got to jack your papers. Okay? Finally, anytime you use a quote or a reference to the text, you have to explain its relevancy to the point you're making in that point of validation. So in other words, a way we say this is a quote doth not a POV make. Just because you quote something doesn't mean you're finished. You always have to explain after the quote, whether it's direct or indirect, what the point is to the topic that you're working with in that POV. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, that's called internal validation, quoting from Harrison Bergeron. The next step for us, as honor sophomores, is that we will then step outside of the text and ask a really intriguing question. What have other people said about Vonnegut and Harrison Bergeron? Now, where will I go to find intel like that? You're right, I'll go research, won't I? No, multiple places. Obviously, the net's going to help me a lot. I'm also going to go to this thing called the library, and I'm going to actually look up in sometimes books and stuff like that, you see. Uh, but increasingly, as we do our research, most of it is online, since lots of libraries now have all, all their holdings, right, uh, you know, already online for us. But we want to begin to consider what other people have to say. We call that external validation. Internal validation, quoting from the text. External validation, quoting from other research that we find, and very soon, that's where we will be going. Thanks, Mr. McGee, for making me a better student, and that will be an important next step for us as sophomores. Did you guys do much of that as freshmen?
where you went to outside sources to do research? Okay, so you read Casca de Montilado and you pretty much just wrote about Casca de Montilado. You didn't go to the research to find out what's been written about Poe and Casca de Montilado. Let me make a suggestion then, from this point on, just a, a heads up to help you. Every time you get ready to read a text in this class, I suggest that you Google it real quickly and just get a sense of what's out there. But where I'm going to recommend that you go, and you may want to write this down, I'm going to recommend that you go to databases and not just straight Google. One of the places I'm going to recommend that you go, and look at it tonight just so you know what I'm talking about. You can Google search this, by the way, in Google to find it. It's called Google Scholar, S-C-H-O-L-A-R, Google Scholar. And I highly recommend that you take a look at this database. What is cool about Google Scholar is that it will narrow your search to only academic sources. <laughs> so for example, if you were to type in Vonnegut, you'll get a whole bunch of sites that will take you to where you can buy books by Vonnegut, right? Which, I mean, doesn't do you a lot of good. What you want is academic research and treatment of Vonnegut and a more particular Harrison Bergeron. So um, Google Scholar, that's all that you will find there. You can't, you're not gonna get sent to anything, you know, about how to buy the books or whatever or any of that kind of stuff. Of course, we realize that most of what's on the open net is out there to make money, right? To sell you something. That's not any value to you when you're doing research. We will ultimately have Ms. Overcast, school media consultant, and she will join us to be able to debrief you on specifics of some of the databases that are out there that I want you to become familiar with. Obviously, Wikipedia is a very useful online source for us. We're not going to, however, consider it an academic source. Why not, Ms. Costales? You're right, because uh, the, the, the Wikipedia sites can be updated and, uh, and often not by scholars, and so to that degree, we see it as sometimes dubious. Having said that, though, Wikipedia is a great first step for us to find intel, generally speaking, especially in academic sources. You know, most people don't update academic stuff on Wikipedia as much as they update more popular types of stuff. All right? Questions, comments about any of this? I now want to turn, we will be looking now for the rest of our hour together with some of the annotations of our readings of last week. Given the insanity of last week, we are, uh, we're a little bit behind in our discussions, but that's okay. Because again, as we said before, we don't plan on covering always every one of the texts that we work with. Okay, uh, But you may want to have out your annotations for Bergeron, and let's go searching for summer. That's where we'll probably want to start. Okay, let's start with John. Um, moving our packets back, just like in general, do we just kind of... That's a good question. What do I do with a reading, writing, assessment packet that I get back? You want to usually dismember it if you want to keep everything in order, or just hold on to those packets. For sure, the cover sheet, master schedule section. I would say for sure that. Why would I say for sure that? Because normally that's where my score that I'm going to give you goes, and it's a good record keeper. Now, sometimes I forget and I put your score on the last page of your packet. Either way, just hold on to it so you have a record of it. Mr. McGee, you entered my score for my reading, writing assessment packet number 9 in Infinite Campus as a 70. You should have entered it as a 90. Uh, if I go to my grade book, which is the only other place I have for record keeping, and I say, dude, I entered it as a 70 there too, then the only thing that can help you to get your score that you want is to be able to say, well, here's my packet, or here's that cover sheet. Look, see, you gave it, and I go, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't read my handwriting as a 7 or as a... Nine, I read it as a seven. That could happen. Vera start, starts smiling because Mr. McGee's handwriting is sometimes not so good. Did I say it gently right? Yeah, it's not so good always, so sorry about that. Trust me, over time, you'll get to where you can read it, though. That's a sick thought. You're going to read enough of my handwriting that you'll actually be able to read it. So, Okay. All right, let's go to work. We have already introduced some concepts, but I want to review because some of our colleagues were absent. Uh, and maybe unable yet to study the video. There are different types of writing, genres of writing. Let's use that French word now, a genre of writing. What do I mean when I use that term, genres of writing? Does anyone know what that means? Varieties. Variety. What are different genres of writing that we often will refer to? We can talk about romance versus, uh, you know, uh, science fiction versus, that's one way we use the term genre. The other way is, of course, to talk about types of writing in a different way, where we talk, for example, about novels versus short stories versus poems versus essays versus screenplays versus plays themselves. For example, when you pick up, as you will with me later, um, 
um, Shakespeare's J.C., Julius Caesar, we'll be looking at a play that's quite different from reading Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron. Those are two different kinds of projects. And if you don't understand that, it can be kind of difficult to read those two texts. One of the biggest problems about reading, for example, any of Poe, we will read more Poe this year. Uh, when you read Cascabe Montelado last year, if you didn't understand you were reading Poe, and he is this really important founder of experimental short fiction, then all of a sudden it's kind of hard to read his stuff. So having some sense of genre is important. Apocalyptic texts are a kind of type of, of genre of writing that we have seen and talked about already. At 3A, jot down for you, we mentioned the text The Giver last time. What are for you some of the more important apocalyptic texts that you're already familiar with? Start with print and then go to film. Uh, what are for you? Now what is an apocalyptic text again? Like when we, end of the world. End of the world, that's right. Texts that suggest the end is coming and it's not a very pretty picture at all. Usually, what was our P word that we used? Apocalyptic texts can be pejorative. That's right in nature. That is to say, they don't go, yay, about the future of the world, but rather, bad. Everything is bad. And there's certain reasons for that that we're going to get to now right away. That's right, Wally and Wally hands. Of course, some of you will even say that Disney's playing a very interesting ap apocalyptic game in that text that we call Wally. Right, um, and what's going on there? And you know, even though the text kind of ends hopeful, there are apocalyptic kinds of traces through that text. Obviously, mostly a criticism of what apocalyptically? Are there future? Uh, there, there is issues of nutrition, no doubt. But what about the physical world? Yes, it is. It's an environmentally conscious type of, of, of message, isn't it? Now, we can use a word here that, if, uh, if you want, you can jot down. This word is propedeutic. Now, a propedeutic is a text inclining to teach, didactic. You're supposed to learn something from it, okay? You're supposed to learn something from it. Now, sometimes these texts that we'll be studying are kind of blatantly, obviously, propedeutics. Other times, you're going to have to infer, what am I supposed to understand? When I'm reading Harrison Bergeron, what is it that Vonnegut <coughs> seems to be suggesting about the world and the future? Because when he writes the text, he clearly has a certain kind of concern about society and the way society is starting to kind of look a certain way, and he's really concerned. Jot down in your notes, what is it that you think Vonnegut is so concerned about <coughs> looking forward. What is it that seems to bug him so much? Because it's a strange story, especially in the end, isn't it? It's a really kind of whacked out story in the end, isn't it? Anyone want to take a stab at this one? What, is the, what do you think he's most concerned about? What do you think, Mr. Erman? Trout? Government control. Government control. See, some people will read this story as kind of government control, right? Ooh, bad, right? Uh, what else? Ignorance. Ignorance of humans can lead to what? Violence. Ignorance can lead to violence. Good. Ignorance can lead to violence. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's one way to study a text is to kind of look at its elements tending towards instruction, right? There's another way, though, that we want to look at text, and now I'm with you at 2B, all right? We want to talk about texts from a different perspective. And I'll throw this model at you, and then if we have time, we'll get to the Aiken text. What's the Aiken text? Searching for summer. Good. So here we go. There was a German dramaticist. And he studied lots and lots of plays. And about texts, he said the following. He said, texts that are narrative in their structure seem to have what he called a certain kind of plot development. Okay? Plot development. What do I, what do I mean when I use this word plot? You want to know what that word means? What's that word mean? A plot of a story is it's what? 
conflict? It's basically the map of the story, right? It tells us the narrative development of the story. And Freytag observed that there's a certain kind of continuum that he referenced with what later will be known as the plot hill. Have you been introduced to this? Yeah. Yeah. Hurrah. So now this will be a review that started for you, probably this intel started for you in fifth or sixth grade when they began to give you some sense of stories and the like. Of course, if you'll think about it, every Bernstein bear will follow a very similar kind of plot line. Every movie that you watch will follow a very similar plot line. First we have what he called the exposition, right? Here we have certain kinds of setup information. Primarily we have issues of character, correct? Mm -hmm. We have issues of time, where does the story take place in terms of time, and finally issues of setting, don't we, right? Then he said there's this thing called rising action, right? The primary emphasis in rising action is the development of conflict or the fight or the struggle, we might say, right? And then he divided conflict up into two types. What were those types? You're right. Internal conflict and what? You're right. External conflict, correct? And we'll define really quickly, what do we mean by internal conflict? Character allowing C to reference character, uh, versus, that means against, correct? And then here we'll just put self, right? So the character is trying, oh no, what, what, what should I do? I'm so concerned, I'm trying to figure this out, et cetera, et cetera. This is, of course, internal conflicts are what we often refer to as psychological in their construction, right? What psychologically should I do, et cetera? External conflicts divide up into predominantly three. We can have character versus another character. The most dangerous game is, of course, one of the most famous about, you know, two idiot men. This tells you all you need to know about men, right? Running around an island trying to kill each other. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, character versus character, where inevitably, you know, there's going to be some kind of physical, you know, conflict, fight, whatever. Secondly, character versus nature. These are the stories where the guy rides his snow machine out, gets it, you know, gets pinned underneath it. A storm comes in and he has to survive in the middle of the mountains. Character versus nature. And then finally, what's that last one? Do you remember? How are you taught it? Character versus society. Good. Character versus society or the group. It could be as well character versus the idea. Of course, the idea as derived from the society. Here, you have notions of the character who is going to struggle against a number of other characters in some way, usually other than physical. So it's going to be some kind of friction or struggle that would be more social in its, in its orientation. And then obviously, to some degree, that ties rather nicely into character versus self and the psychological dimensions as well. Now, Freetag also said that in the development of characterization, you have the use of dialogue. That happens in the rising action, and that will be important in the stories that you will write and create as we get ready for our young author submissions. Yes. Um, we'll think about that. At some point, though, Freetag said in all stories, there will be this thing that he calls the climax of the story, right? Now, what is the climax of the story? Well, how do we define that? When it, we'll call it the turning point. Yes, we can call it the turning point. That's, that's an, uh, an interesting way to say it. But what does that mean, turning turning point? Like I understand if I'm walking this direction and then I turn around. It's like kind of a significant. A significant, good, that's a good way to say it as well. We, when we're young, will often refer to this as the most exciting moment in the story. Of course, that's a somewhat sophomoric rendering of what we mean when we say climax. I'm going to use free tags academic language. The climax is the fruition of the conflict. It's the fruition of the conflict. In other words, it's the moment in the story when the conflict finally reaches its penultimate moment. This is kind of why turning point is a useful anecdote, as long as you understand what it is we're talking about in regards to turning. And of course, ultimately, we're talking about the conflict. But here's the deal. And this is an important observation for you sophomores. The story can have different climaxes depending upon what conflict you're focusing on. Because as we enter our sophomore year, we will begin to read stories that are more complex in their conflict. 
a really solid short story, for example, can have more than one identifiable conflict. You could already think of Harrison Bergeron and the ways in which if we were to ask, well, Harrison Bergeron, what is the central conflict of that text? Is it internal or is it external? See, some of you will say, Whew, well, that all depends on how you read the story and where you want to focus your energies. It's true that, of course, you have a character versus society, clearly an external conflict. But obviously, Harrison himself is trying to come to deal with the fact of the issues of nonconformity. Depending then upon how you want to focus on conflict, you will have a view of what is the climax of the story. See, we could ask this. What is for you the climax of the story, Harrison Bergeron? See? And that'll, that'll kind of depend, right? Depend upon, notice, notice instead of immediately answering the question, what's the climax, find yourself rather asking this more intriguing question, as I read the story, what conflict was I most focusing on? Because if you analyze that, that will tell you what you consider to be the climax of the story. By the way, there's no one right answer to these kinds of questions. And really solid short stories will take a kind of, uh, we'll, we'll look at several potential conflicts within the story. We'll be reading several classic short stories where we will argue there's multiple conflicts that are at play simultaneously. It's symphonic. It's like listening to good music, if you will. Finally, there's this thing that we call falling action. What was the French word that was used to describe this falling action? Did anyone learn that one? No, the resolution is, is, is of course, the word, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's what we call this, right? But um, I'm talking about a French word. Do you know the word denouement? The denouement of a story is what? It's its falling action. It's, it's literally, it's our French word for tying up or bringing together, okay? So the denouement is going to be the ending of our story. Sometimes in the resolution process, we get the, in the older, older stories, Aesop's and others, some kind of moral to the story is blah, 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 right? Okay. So this is what Freetag had to say about good short fiction. Let's put it to work by looking at Aiken's Searching for Summer, which is a very interesting little apocalyptic text. Why would I say this is an apocalyptic text? What makes it an apocalyptic text? Again, you want to jot this down if you haven't already written, written it uh, in your notes. What makes Searching for Summer an apocalyptic text? Can be specific. Right, right. We know that there's something really bad that has gone on preceding to before the story itself. Why is sunshine such a big deal? Because there's so much like ash and smoke. There is none, right? There is none. Why is there no sunshine? There's been a war. So now we're to conflict resolution issues. When these stories are written in the 50s, there is great concern about nuclear weapons. Why? Historically, why? They can destroy. Keep going. The Soviet Union was stockpiling weapons of, of nuclear ability. But why was that of concern? What had transpired earlier at the end of the Second World War that created so much concern about nuclear weapons? What are we familiar with? We took out Japan. That's right. The dropping of two nuclear weapons on two business centers in Japan. The first, of course, was Hiroshima. The second was, of course, Nagasaki. Both towns you can still visit today and, of course, still suffering. The, the leftover residuals of this dropping of these bombs. Now, let's point out, when these bombs were dropped, there had never been uh, this kind of detonation on humans before, in testing, but never on humans. There was great uncertainty about even whether the bombs would go off. There was great concern that they would just drop and hit the ground and thud and nothing would happen, right? Um, there was uncertainty as to what it would mean to drop these bombs. After the bombs are dropped, the two bombs, there is a collective uh-oh that happens around the world. Why uh-oh? Yes, no weapons had ever been used of this magnitude. And immediately, there were concerns about what residual would remain namely in the air within that region. And then as soon as breezes started, which of course happens all the time in Japan because it's so much ocean around, 
all of a sudden radioactive material is being sent through the air and now all of a sudden into two and sometimes three generations you have birth defects and stuff like that happening. Collectively, people around the world went uh-oh. But there was also the concern about the a, a 3A observation. Uh, um, there was a great concern about the advantages of having these weapons. What does that mean, the advantages? The one who has these bombs, who has this technology, can kind of tell everybody else what to do, and if they don't want to do it, you can kind of threaten to blow them up with one of these weapons, right? Okay, so immediately there's what we call today the arms race begin. Now, does that mean that everyone's running around on their arms? No. What does it mean, arms race? Arms is the same word for what? What do arms mean? Weapons, that's it, weapons, yes, technology and weapons. And so there's a race, race how? Like all these bombs jump up and start running down the track? No, what does this mean, arms race? And I'm sorry, I should be using swimming examples for racing. Bombs jumping into the pool and swimming with their little fins back. No, that's not what we mean by racing. What we mean here is the buildup of stockpiles of these weapons, and right away, Two countries begin stockpiling large numbers of these munitions. What two countries? The United States and the Soviet Union, later to, of course, only be called Russia. And so this building up of these weapons leads large numbers of artists and writers to immediately grow concerned. Why? What are they concerned about? What about the future? That's right. At what point... Do these weapons become determined useful? Mm -hmm. And more particularly, what happens if we can't control their use? Forget about the fact of the devastation that's remaining. One of the ways to address this is to sit down and write essays. Nuclear bombs, bad. Don't blow them up, bad. That's one way, write essays. Another way to do it, though, is Aiken's way. What was Aiken's way of doing it? Read a story. That you never mention, notice in the story, there isn't really a lot of mention about what happened. Notice the story kind of assumes that everyone kind of knows what happened and why it's a big dog deal. There's some sun anywhere. Of course, if you're a reader of this story in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, you kind of are reading the story going, whoa, 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 wait, what? where do they live on the planet that there's like no sunshine? What's going on? Right? And then you get to start putting things, oh, wait a This is a story that's forecasting a future, now we're apocalyptic, that's not so good because humans decided to go ahead and blow themselves up. Right? And in the process, destroy the environment so badly that now there ain't no sunshine anymore. What's the big deal about not having sunshine, by the way? Who cares? Talk biology for me a second. Why is sunshine a big deal? Yeah, you gotta have sunshine to have what process? Photosynthesis. So what if you don't have photosynthesis? Who cares? Yeah, if you got no plants, you got no oxygen. You got no oxygen, nobody gets to live. Right? So in other right, no food. That's right. So in other words, ostensibly, it's destruction of a global scale that leads ultimately to everyone dying. Now, how does Aiken's story kind of address this issue in a really fairly creative way? This is a love story, isn't it? In what ways could you argue this is a love story? That's right. What is it that these two couple are doing? They're getting married. Hurrah, they're in love. Yay. Of course, right? Right. Okay. So Aiken is making an interesting observation about love in this story, correct? But what is the central message of this story? Appreciation. Appreciation of what? What you take from it. Things that you normally take for granted, like what? Sunshine. Clearly the sun. Food, water. Food, water. Oxygen. Fundamental uh, needs of survival. Yeah. Is that all, though? I don't know. I, I, I was thinking about Yeah, you just take marriage for granted. Because I know a lot of people don't realize the gravity of that. Yes.